click the record button. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to end our work week talking about um, EMIS, uh, that fun topic. And um, we're going to focus this morning on just the initial um, staff and course collection. So we've, we're going to break this up into a couple different um, sessions and, you know, give you um, what to look for at the start um, of the school year and in that initial staffing course collection. And then we'll regroup again um, as the year goes along and talk about things that pertain just to like the final staff and course collection. Um, we have made some changes to the checklist. Um, so I did want to point those out. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware of where the, the checklist might um, be housed at, I'll start from the beginning. Um, for, so from our um, documentation um, wiki page, there's actually um, a, a chapter that's called USPS and EMIS Connection. So if you click on that, um, you can see the look changed just slightly. Um, this will be going away um, once we get the, the last part of that um, checklist incorporated into the checklist we're gonna talk about this morning. Then um, all you'll see here is the staff and course L is the name of the collection checklist. So this will be going away. So if you click on um, that link, you can see it looks just slightly different. Um, and this is what we're going to be covering this morning. So everything related to the start of the school year, um, what districts need to get ready um, to begin that initial collection. Um, you know, there's there are some things that, you know, carry over from um, the last collection. Um, so we want to clean those up and, um, you know, be ready to start the initial collection and, and have accurate information reported. So. The um, first part of the checklist just, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's it's just pointing out that, you know, now in redesign, there's three parts to reporting an, an employee's information. So one is the employee record, um, and we've, you know, placed the path in the general section, there's a report to EMIS um, flag. On the position record, there's in that EMIS related information section, there's also a reportable to EMIS checkbox. And then lastly, um, is the compensation record. Um, so in the state reporting section, there's a reportable to EMIS checkbox. In order for an employee's information to be reported correctly, all three of those pieces need to be in place. So all of those report to EMIS, so to speak, checkboxes need to be marked. So that's where the tricky part comes into play because, um, you know, as you're all aware, compensations are no longer overridden like they were in classic with job screen. So um, they, they're, uh, a new compensation is created. So we no longer want to report that old compensation from last year, we need to report the new information for this year. So that's where um, some, you know, help between, you know, you at the ITC level and the district probably come into play. You know, it's super important that, you know, you're, you, you're all on the same page as far as who's doing what um, in this process that we're going to talk about this morning. Um, so, Again, um, it, you know, it does take some communication and kind of a plan um, from you at the ITC to make sure that nothing gets missed. Um, moving right along then, um, just a note about those position um, override fields. So what I'm talking about is if you go to the position record, let's log out here. Um, if you remember back to classic, for those of you that, um, you know, or were around for that time. Um, on job screen, there was an EMIS contract info section. Um, that's were those were considered like the override fields for EMIS reporting. Um, in redesign, we have those same fields. 
So those fields are on the position record within this EMIS related information. And it's these fields here, the, the full-time equivalents see, the contract work days, the contract amount, and the hours in a day. So if anything is reported in these fields, that's what's going to get reported in the collection, not what's on the actual compensation record. Or in this case, um, when we're talking about um, full-time equivalency reported in this FTE field. Okay, so one thing I pointed out in the last um, EMIS session that, that we had together, um, I did um, make a suggestion, but for those of you that might have not um, been able to um, be in on that, um, what is nice is these are custom fields. So um, it is helpful um, that you, um, uh, you might want to change these um, using the custom field. I will get back to the chat in one second. I'm sorry, I'm not ignoring you. And again, please interrupt me at any time if, if I don't see your question or if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me um, at any point. So under utilities, there's the cust, I'm sorry, the um, under system, there's the custom field definition. And what's nice is you can actually change the display name to be something more specific. So if we um, go down then to the position record, that full-time equivalency field, the contract work days, the contract amount, um, what we've encouraged um, districts to do or ITCs can help is maybe make these more meaningful. So, you know, maybe put EMIS override in front of these fields. And that way, if I go back to the grid, and I open up one of those position records, you can see that it makes it a little more meaningful in the fact that it is the EMIS override field for the contract amount, okay? When you look at the, the information on the grid, um, there are no differences between um, the regular compensation contract amount, contract work days, hours in a day. So it can get confusing seeing both of those um, columns on the grid at the same time and the, the, the column heading is the exact same. So if you change that um, to be, you know, say like EMIS override or something that's a little more meaningful when it comes to those position override fields, that can be helpful um, when it comes to, you know, looking at the information and generating a report for it. Okay. All right. So I'd like to see all those. Yes. So we I know we have a JIRA issue for that, Tammy. Um, I will make a note and um, definitely, you know, increase the, that time reported for you um, and add a note, you know, that it was mentioned at our um, session this morning. Thank you. Um, I can look it up. Um, can I can I get that to you? Maybe send it to you in email in an email. Okay, perfect. That sounds good. Okay, all right. So moving right along then, going back to our checklist. So, uh, you know, that's what we talk about when we talk about the EMIS override fields. Just make sure that, you know, districts know that they do not have to enter something in these fields for every single employee. It's only those that they want something different reported when it comes to the to EMIS and that collection than what's reported on their regular compensation or, or um, you know, the FT on their position record. Okay, um, next is just a note that um, archive records are automatically excluded from the collection. So once records are archived, they're ignored altogether. Um, so that's why, you know, archiving those prior year compensation records are so important or an easier way to, you know, just omit them from um, getting collected and, and reported. And then lastly um, is a note um, regarding per debt um, and USP EMX. 
Um, that Those options are currently not available. Um, we do have a JIRA issue for a replacement for per debt. Again, I, I apologize, I don't have that number um, handy, but I know that we have one um, and it's been discussed with our developers, you know, many times. Um, so we do, you know, ask that districts, you know, once they have the collection collected, they're using their level one reports for anything, um, any errors that might have happened. So that's what they're using as, quote, their per debt replacement. Okay. All right. Um, when it comes to like USP EMX, um, because the SOAP service is, you know, directly talking to um, the application, there's not a need for that file to be downloaded and uploaded into the data collector anymore. Those are, you know, it's an automatic, um, automatic thing. Okay, so just a couple notes to kind of keep in mind and make you aware of. I'm sure you're you're all aware of it, but just wanted to point those out um, before we you know dive into the actual checklist itself. Um, so the first thing that will need to happen is um, changing that EMIS configuration fiscal year. So right now um, the system is using. Um, if I go to system configuration and I go to EMIS configuration um, and help if I click the right EMIS reporting configuration, my bad. <clears throat> um, you see here that the fiscal year is, is set. So this field here is determining what records to extract when it comes to um, pulling those records into the data collector. So this is super important. There are many, many, many times that districts start the school year, they're ready to start their first collection um, for that new school year, and they're saying all my new staff is missing. You know, the reason being is probably this um, fiscal year didn't get rolled over, it didn't get changed. So this will need to be switched to 2024. Um, and then, you know, the correct information, the system knows that updated date range to use to pull that information, okay? All right, so it's important that that gets set. Um, I did, you know, we do have a note here that says, you know, if so if, if districts are looking at this, you know, some ITCs, some of you update that for your districts. Um, others, you know, make that, you know, happen on the district end. So you just kind of, again, like we talked about in the beginning, need to have a plan in place you know, to know who's going to change that or be responsible for changing it um, so that, you know, it does get done. Next is, and we kind of touched upon this um, a little while ago, is to make sure that all your prior year compensations are either archived or it's, you know, some way they're not being reported as um, being reportable to EMIS. So some districts, they like the fact of seeing multiple compensation records. You know, when they go to an employee's dashboard, um, they can see the last two or three years, the last year um, plus the current year. You know, that's a district decision. So in that case, you know, they're not going to want to actually go in and just archive all of those records because they want to see them. Um, and in that case, they would want to use mass load. And they would load then, you know, extract um, a file um, to be able to load back in um, to make all of those compensation records not reportable. So in our mass load chapter um, within the compensation section, you know, here's the information then that would be need to be extracted from um, that compensation grid. Um, and then there's an archived option um, the column heading over here, and then obviously that would be false. I'm sorry, true, <laughs> my bad, I said that backwards. That would be true to archive those records. Now, again, you might need to use some additional, you know, columns on that compensation grid, like last pay date, um, maybe a label, um, compensation start and stop dates to help you pull um, those, you know, records that, that do need to be archived. 
So the same is sort of the case when it comes to using um, the mass change option. Um, we do have a definition um, that you can um, download and then upload um, into um, the report um, manager. I'm sorry, upload in a mass change for you to actually um, just, you know, in a couple clicks, mass change all of those records. So um, I do have the, um, the, def the mass change definition listed, linked in um, the checklist, or I wanted to show you where it actually was in case you needed to, um, you know, go out and look at the source for any reason. So under um, the state software applications homepage, um, there is um, an option called redesign shared training and implementation documents. And if you click on that, the third option is where you're gonna find all those shared reports and mass change definitions. So if I click on that, the first section is the mass change definitions. And if I scroll down a little bit, here's all those report definitions. So the one that we're talking about is this archived employee. So again, you can download this, you know, um, mass change definition, import it into mass change, and then, you know, filter your grid um, accordingly and just click on that archive mass change option. And, you know, in a couple clicks, those are those uh, compensations are archived. Yes, that's exactly correct. Carol, did I misspeak? Um, the compensation starts start and stop dates um, do control, but in order to control what fiscal year needs to be reported, it does look at those um, that date first and then pulls any compensation start and stop dates that fall within that period. Okay, does that help? They, they, the two sort of work together. Okay, I apologize if I said something that wasn't clear, but yes, um, those, those that configuration fiscal year works with those compensation start and stop dates um, in order to control what information gets pulled in. That's why if, like I mentioned before, if you don't change that fiscal year configuration to the new year, all of the new staff is going to be missing because they'll have dates, you know, in the next fiscal year. The information that's probably being included in the, the report without that fiscal year being changed for your old staff is going to be last year's information, not the current year. Okay, perfect. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so um, back to archiving your employees. So um, again, if you go to core and you go to compensation, um, it's probably best, you know, to go to the contract compensation tab. Um, and you have a little more, you know, control over what um, records you're going to archive. Like I said, you might want to use, you know, the label, which that's why we encourage districts, you know, to use some sort of label to identify all of last year's or, you know, each fiscal year's information. So I've changed a couple um, from the silly label that probably doesn't make much sense to something um, that's more meaningful. So like fiscal year 23, um, you could use the, also use like the last pay date, you could use start and stop dates. Um, so, you know, whatever makes the most sense for how your district, you know, has set up, you know, their labels or their compensations. I'm going to click on the mass change option. Hmm. I wonder where my definitions went. Okay, so I'm going to step you through the whole process. We're going to, I've downloaded that archived employee. 
I apologize. I think I downloaded the wrong one and I did the employee. Let's see here. If I go to employee, I bet you this is the one. Yeah, there we go. All right. So um, going back to the mass load option, I apologize. I had this all set up perfect, and I must have downloaded the wrong definition. So let me go back. I have it here, I think. Huh. Okay, let's try this again. Let's put it back in our, and I'm gonna click mass change. Another thing that I wanted to point out before we do actually like click the change is we always encourage you to run a report or have the district run a report um, of what's going to be changed because there is no, as you know, undo button. So if you generate a report first, at least you have some um, audit trail of, you know, the information that was um, changed. So if you ever needed to load that back in to undo what was done, um, that, you know, these reports can be super helpful. All right, let's try this again. I do not know what I did wrong here. All right, so I've imported that definition. I can even save that definition. And you can see it, it's um, now in my uh, load definition dropdown. And I'm gonna click um, execute. And you can see here, you know, always wanna verify that, you know, yes, I'm only changing X number of records and that looks correct to me. So I'm going to click submit. So now, if I would include archived and I open up one of these records, you can see that that archived checkbox is marked. Okay. Sorry for that little hiccup. I thought I had them all, you know, imported and uh, ready to go, but I must have missed that one for some reason. All right. Are there any questions when it comes to um, mass changing um, compensations? You know, again, it's kind of on a, um, you know, a district by district ITC preference. Um, I know some ITCs allow their districts to use mass change. Others don't um, provide them that option. So it's, you know, in that case, it's you working one-on-one -on -one with each district to, you know, as soon as they're ready to have those compensations archived um, so that the correct information gets reported. Okay, moving right along then um, is clearing the long-term illnesses from last year. So um, we've had some questions about, you know, the report um, entity, report count entity summary report. It's a mouthful. Um, this report here um, and where those long-term um, illness values are coming from. And it's coming right from the source. So. Um, again, if you have employees that have a long-term illness entered on that record, then those reports that are using the long-term illness field um, to report that information are pulling right from that value. So you want to start fresh with next year's, you know, everybody starting with zero. Um, so you can actually go in and filter your employee grid. And if there's only a handful, just click the edit button and clear those manually. Um, however, you know, if you're a larger district or somebody, a district that does have quite a, a few um, that this needs cleared for, then you can actually use the mass change option. So again, I'm gonna go to that employee record and I'm gonna show you exactly where that field is. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but just in case. So under the state reporting section, there's a field called long-term long illness, okay? So 
Um, any value that's entered here gets reported to EMIS in the collection. Remember, these, this field is a subset of attendance records. So if you have 25 in the long-term illness field, there must be at least 25 or more attendance records. Otherwise, it's going to flag an error. Okay. So again, you know, if you only have a handful of long-term illnesses, um, then they can be cleared manually. Otherwise, um, you know, if this is something you want to use mass change for, um, we have the you have the ability to use um, a mass change definition to do that. So I've added the long-term illness column to my grid, and you can see here, you know, it looks like I have what five um, employees that have a value in that long-term illness field. Again, you can click edit and clear those manually, or I'm gonna use mass change. And I've already, um, you know, have the definition um, entered here. Um, this is one that's actually provided by SSDT. Um, so you can see it has SSDT behind it. So I'm gonna select the clear long-term illness um, mass change definition. I have just those records that I want to use or want to be cleared. Again, always helpful to run the report first. And I'm going to click execution to change switch to that mode. And then I'm going to click submit mass change. And you can see here now um, in my grid above, there's nobody you know, listed with the long-term illness um, field greater than, than zero or less than. I'm sorry, they're all less than zero. There's nobody greater than zero. Okay. All right. Any questions about long-term illnesses? Okay. Next is incrementing um, the experience fields. So these, when we talk about experience fields, we're talking about the total, the authorized, and then the principal. Um, Keep in mind that, you know, at the start of the school year, we want those um, experience fields to be increased and then um, they're left alone all school year until the start of the next fiscal year. Um, those new employees, you know, they should not receive a, a year's worth of credit until next year. So you'll want to keep that in mind, you know, if you're using mass change to increment those. Um, then, you know, make sure that they're excluded from the uh, mass update, or you'll have to go back and, you know, basically undo the, the information for those employees. So we do have, again, um, a couple mass change definitions. Again, they're out on those that um, uh, redesign shared report or mass definitions page which I want to make a side note about while we're talking about this. Um, we, we are, we do have plans um, to actually move this to the report library. Um, so in the near future, um, this is a page is kind of hidden um, and not a lot of people know it's out there. Um, and we did have a question come in this week about, you know, where can I find these in the documentation? Um, and so it is kind of a hidden gem that, that we do want you to know about. We do want you to have easy access to it. So in the very near future, these will be moved then to, um, if we go to help, to the public um, shared library, report library, and we'll put them all in one place. So most of you are probably familiar with this and this is this is your go-to. Um, so we're gonna make it easy for you to, to find those. So kind of a side note, sorry, got off on that little, tangent, but I didn't want you to forget about, I didn't want to forget to tell you. Okay, so back to um, increasing the years of experience. So you can use mass change. Um, there's actually two definitions um, that allow you to change the authorized and the total years all in one mass change, um, you know, upload or click, or you can just change only the total years of experience. So if that's you know something that that uh, your district wants, um, you have the ability to use this mass change definition to just increase the the total years of experience. Then obviously they'd have to do something different for the authorized. Um, 
this definition here, we'll do both in one shot. So again, we've kind of, um, you know, put some detail into, you know, going to the employee grid, you want to, you know, filter your grid so that you're not upload updating everybody, um, but you can use that advanced query option, um, choose the termination date is null, um, and then click that up, apply query, and then filter it by last paid date equaling, you know, whatever um, total years greater than zero, authorized years greater than zero. Um, and then that will pull in just those records that you want them to use the mass change and, and to be updated. Okay, so we put those, both of those mass change definitions here and link those in the documentation. So again, you can go in, download those, import those um, into the mass change option and um, use those to, to update your total, um, your experience fields. When it comes to the principal's years of experience, um, more than likely there's, you know, maybe a handful of principals um, in each district. So we do ask that you just filter those um, on the grid itself and then update those, you know, manually. <clears throat> So if there's, you know, your principles here, we could even do this, you know, greater than zero. And you can see that, you know, these are probably, um, you know, those five employees are your principles. Um, again, these could be passed. So maybe there's only a handful. Just edit those records and then increase that um, principles years of experience. The experience fields are all, you know, in a section by themselves. So we were talking about the authorized, the total, and then the principles. So those are the three fields that we're talking about. The other option is to use mass load. So again, um, you know, if you're a district or you're an ITC that doesn't allow your district um, the ability to use mass change and you want, you know, it to be on the district's um, hands to to update and, and change, which is totally understandable, um, you can use mass load. So in um, the mass load section here, um, we've kind of outlined exactly from the employee grid um, what fields you'll want to include. Um, and then you can go, you know, use that advanced query option again um, to kind of drill down and, and filter out um, even more information and then you'll generate that um, you know, in Excel field names. Remember Excel field names, I'm gonna scroll up just a little bit here so you can see it. Um, that should extract the column headings um, in the proper format for you to load them back in. So anytime you're doing any kind of extracting you know, into a file to be loaded back in the system, um, you'll want to select that format as Excel field names in hopes that you won't have to change those column headings um, to load that information back in. So you'll, you know, generate your report, update that report to make it, you know, you can use a formula um, to, to in, in Excel then to increase those experience fields by one. Um, and then once your, your load file is updated correctly, You'll save that in CSV format and then use mass load. And, and you're all familiar with it's under utilities. Um, you'll you know, select the, the file that you just created and then the importable entity will be employee and you'll load that file. So again, there's a couple different ways to um, go about updating your experience fields um, you know, using mass load or mass change. Okay, um, <clears throat> next then, excuse me, <clears throat> step five um, is updating the degree type and semester hours. So any um, employee that has a change in their degree and or semester hours, those need to be updated as well. So under the employee record, <clears throat> excuse me, a little frog in my throat. 
Under the state reporting section, there's the degree type and semester hour fields. Um, again, you know, you can put this in a load file if you like, um, or, you know, if there's only a handful of people, you can go in and just manually, um, you know, update this information for those that had changes. Next, then moving on to step six is you want to clear any of that information that we talked about um, earlier that's sitting in those override fields. So, you know, we want to start over um, or, you know, change anybody, update anything that might, might have changed for those that you want to continue to use those override fields for. Um, but to clear it, um, you can go then, you know, to see who needs to be changed. You can, again, use that position grid And any of those override fields, you know, you can filter it greater than zero. And you know then that these are the employees that have something in the contract amount. You can do the same thing for the contract work days, the hours in a day, um, and then the, even the FTE. So if this needs to be cleared or updated, you know, for these employees, filter the grid, and then go in and make the appropriate changes. Okay, again, you know, districts do not have to put something in these fields for every single employee. Um, I think we've come across that quite a bit. They only need to enter something in these fields on the position record if they need to report something different for EMIS purposes. Okay. Um, you also have the ability to use mass load to actually clear these. So, um, you know, again, just like we talked about, you can filter the grid so that you have the employees that need to be changed or cleared. Um, and then, you know, here's the columns you want to make sure that you have um, added to your grid. And again, we talked about filtering that, you know, for those values greater than zero. You'll generate a report then um, using Excel field names. Uh, you know, enter the information as zero so it's cleared, or change it to the new information, whatever the updated information is for the, the um, new fiscal year. You'll save that report in CSV format, and then you'll use mass load. Um, in this case, you'll you know again browse to find that file and you're gonna use the importable entity um, of position, and then that file can be loaded. So a couple different ways, you know, depending on probably the size of your district and how many employees are involved. Okay. All right, good stuff, huh? Everybody's had enough coffee, they're staying with me. <laughs> All right, um, step number seven, is um, talking, referring to any employee that was reported with a separation date and a separation reason in last year's final L reporting period, that collection, that they can be archived. So, you know, once an employee is reported with a separation date and reason, it stays that way for the entire fiscal year. So um, there's no, um, it used to be just one reporting cycle, um, it really doesn't need to be that way anymore. Um, ODE, their logic was it was too confusing to know who you reported when. So once it's reported, just keep it like that for the entire fiscal year, and then they can be no longer employed. So if or no longer reported. So if you archive those, that's the quick way um, to remove them from the collect from them being collected. So you can simply archive those records. Okay. Any employee that left over the summer months or was not reported as separated in the last fiscal year, districts want to enter then on the position record a separation date and a separation reason. And again, leave this this way for the entire fiscal year. And then at the start of next fiscal year, like we just talked about in step seven, they can be archived so they're no longer reported. Okay, and I'm sure you guys know 
where these the field that we're talking about. But um, for those that are new or maybe aren't as familiar with it, um, there's the separation date and reason within this EMIS related information section. So we're talking about a reason here, and then the date is here. Okay. All right. Um, step nine refers to updating those employees that are no longer employed with the district um, or in specific positions. So we talk through then um, what to do to report those employees correctly. So, um, you know, the fields we just talked about will need to be updated, that separation reason and separation date. Um, and then, again, those employees uh, and the status, I'm sorry, the status needs to be changed. So um, from a C to a U, um, we talk about those differences here under these bullets. Um, and then again, that's going to remain the same for the entire fiscal year. And then at the start of next year, um, they can be archived. All right. Okay. Step 10 talks about new employees. So um, again, you know, districts may be entering those new employees over the summer. Um, so as they're getting hired by the board, um, you know, they're putting all their new employee information into the system. Um, you know, probably their final staff reporting, it, you know, is not done until maybe August 4th, just a couple weeks ago. Um, so those new employees that they're entering in the system, you know, they would not at that time um, want those boxes for uh, EMIS reporting to be checked. So just keep that in mind, um, you know, so that those new employees don't get missed um, at the start of the school year. Have districts go in, um, look at their new hires, make sure that on the employee record, those EMIS, the report to EMIS checkbox is marked on the position record, on the compensation record. Um, again, you know, always make sure that all those parts are in place so that they're reported correctly. Just a couple other notes um, when it comes to new employees, make sure that their credential ID is entered. Make sure that credential ID is the correct number of characters. Make sure the credential ID does not have any spaces before it. Those will cause all kinds of headaches when it comes to um, EMIS in reporting that, that employee. Um, and it is you know, rather frustrating um, to try to pinpoint those. So make sure that that you know, field is accurate um, and there's no leading spaces in front of it. Um, next, make sure that on the those new employees that in on the employee record that in that state reporting section, the education level, the semester hours, the total experience, authorized experience, and those principles, if applicable, um, are all entered. Um, that information all has to be reported for those new hires. So make sure that, again, that information is not missing. Um, and then when it comes to the position record, make sure there's a position code, the assignment area, the funding source, and the percent, and then the FTE. So just kind of a quick check for those new employees. Um, again, a lot of times that information, they want to get you know, them entered when they're hired, um, when the board approves them. Um, and a lot of these parts may not be in place at that time. So before the first initial collections done, make sure that you know you kind of go through and have your districts check all these um, new new higher areas. Okay. When it comes to then, you know, we've made all these changes. We've, you know, hopefully got everything um, as as it should be. Um, steps. Um, 11 and 12 and 13 all pertain to um, reports for checking this information. So um, I'm not going to go through, you know, and each one is very, very um, similar, um, but based on what um, the district wants to check, we do have some report definitions available 
again, they're out in that shared um, report or mass change definition definitions page. And if you scroll down, you'll find them under this reports definition section. Again, we'll be moving all this to one place. So um, in the near future, it will be under the, um, the report library. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, um, you can click on the link um, in each of these bullets, and it actually will download that report definition right from the checklist. So you can, you know, stay in one spot. Um, there's also a link to ODE's website. So this is the link then to that um, documentation page that's going to actually, you know, take you to that chapter in the documentation. So if there's questions about it, um, it's going to take you to this section three, the staff records, and allow you then to, um, you know, click on the staff demographic or staff employment um, information and take you right to those sections in the EMIS um, manual. Okay. So if there's questions about, you know, ODE's reporting side of things, that's linked here as well. So the demographic chapter and the employment chapter. Um, I did run these reports just so you get a feel for, you know, what they look like. Um, but again, it's just a quick way for districts to um, have a, an overview of what is going to be, what the collection information is going to look like. Um, so I've, you know, collect, run all of those reports. And you can see here then, you know, based on the report definition, every, you know, report's going to look a little different. Probably not super helpful, you know, in our um, meeting this morning, but I just wanted to let you know that those reports are out there um, and get a taste for what they what they look like. Okay. All right. Another means to check the information is running um, our employee and position reports. So um, if you go to reports, EMIS reports, these two reports are what we're talking about. It is super important that districts run each of these reports before they you know, start any collection of any kind. Um, these reports really do need to be air-free before um, going any further. So I've run both of these. Here's, you're probably familiar with these, but here's the employee report. Now, if you scroll down to the bottom, this is what you want the report to look like. No errors. Go to the position report. It's going to give you a real, you know, quick glance at the positions and the codes that are being reported. And again, if you scroll to the bottom, this is what you want your reports to look like. No errors. I can guarantee you, if you have errors on these reports, you're going to have errors in the data collector. So let's start first by clearing those errors up here. Make this your little perdet, so to speak, um, and clear all of those up before going any further. Now, the errors on the report are very, they all say the same thing, and it virtually says contact your ITC for help. Not very helpful, right? <laughs> so again, developers are aware of this. Um, they are going to work towards, you know, making the, the errors on the report um, much more meaningful. They, they understand the frustrations and the concerns. So um, just keep, you know, keep, keep with us. We'll work together to get through it. Um, however, we did put together um, hopefully something that will be helpful and it's out on our meetings and trainings page. So if you go to our wiki um, under SSDT meetings and trainings, um, under the ITC only re support resources and materials, there's a checklist called debugging EMIS report errors. So this steps you through at the ITC level, again, not, not for district eyes, um, what can be done 
so that you can see what the actual errors are, okay? So in a nutshell, what you need to do is go to system, monitor, logging, okay? So if I go over here, I go to system, monitor, under the logging tab, I'm going to type the word EMISR. This very first option here says EMIS reporting. I'm gonna click over in, yeah, there we go, I, you have to double click, and it brings up a drop down arrow. I'm gonna select the option debug and click save. Again, all of this is in our checklist here, and it actually has screenshots. So it's, you know, again, walking you through exactly what we just did. Now we're going to go and we're going to run under reports those EMIS reports. Again, the EMIS, uh, I'm sorry, the um, employee and the position. When you do that, what happens is, oops. When you go to system monitor and you view the app log, you can see specific employees and errors listed. So these are way more helpful. So we know, you know, in this example, can you guys see this? I'll make it a little bigger, sorry. We know that for this employee, position one, there's a problem with the absence. Um, there's, you know, a problem with multiple active compensations with different hours in a day for this employee and so forth. So these can be, you know, a lot more helpful than just those generic, that generic error that's printed um, on the actual reports. Um, so we do, you know, ask you to work with your districts um, to work through those errors and clear up any of those errors that you might encounter on either of those reports before they even run the collection. Okay, something else I wanted to point out when we're talking about EMIS errors is the fact that we um, created a document that was has all of the level one errors, a description of the errors, Oops, and if I scroll over, it tells you where the location, what field basically this error is referencing in state software. So if you have errors on that debug report, you know, when you're looking in the app log, <clears throat> this might also be a helpful tool as well. So if where to find this, I can show you that. If you go back to that USPS and EMIS connection um, link where you get the checklist, we've linked this spreadsheet right underneath um, that option. Okay, we're trying to, gonna try to keep all those EMIS things together, okay? So if you have an error and it's not quite making sense, you know, use that document um, that we have, you know, it took some time to put together. Um, so use that to your benefit to, you know, give you a start as far as, you know, what fields to look at when it comes to, um, you know, correcting those. Okay. All right. Let me scroll down to where we left off. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay, so step 14 is where you're at, um, and that is running those two reports, the EMIS um, employee report and the EMIS positions report. So again, very important that these be those be air free before you go before the district goes any further. Um, there's also a report that I added to um, the report library called EMIS staff report. Um, again, you can you know, click on the link here and it's gonna download that report definition 
um, or you can go to the report manager and download it from there. Um, but basically what that report is, is just a um, quick snapshot of the employee's um, information. So, you know, the position status, the separation date and reason, the degree type, um, semester hours, contract work days, um, stop date, and how those flags, each of those flags are set on all three records, the employee, the position, and the compensation. So um, that report can be run multiple different ways to help the district look at the information differently. So I've downloaded that or imported that report definition. It's called EMIS staff report. And if you go to the query options, you can see we can run this multiple different ways to get a different look at the data. So if I need to verify all of my employees, you know, are being reported correctly, all of my positions are being reported with the compensation, you know, you can run this multiple times, multiple different ways to get um, a good look at the data um, again before it gets pulled into the data collector. So that's another report that can be used um, to, to check and look over the information. So again, those last you know, several steps are all reporting um, and ways to look at the information, um, you know, multiple different ways. So whatever works best or whatever the district finds to be most helpful, you know, we kind of throw several different options um, at you to be able to do that. Okay. All right. And then step 16 just talks about adding any um, CC or CJ records um, to that might apply to this fiscal year. Um, you might need to, you know, edit or delete or update records from last year. Um, again, that is under core, under EMIS entry. There's two tabs, the EMIS contractor and the EMIS contracted. So within each of these tabs, you have the ability then to create a record. You know, we can edit it, change it, whatever needs to be done for this fiscal year. Um, once all of your C, the district CJ or CC records are added, you can then use the extract data option within each tab. So if they're using, you know, if they have CJ and CC records, there needs to be two, you know, the option needs to be run in each um, tab. <clears throat> Those files then are downloaded, you know, on the user's computer. And then this is the only piece that needs to be uploaded to the data collector. So whether that mean, you know, the file gets sent to an EMIS coordinator and they're responsible for doing that, um, or, you know, the, the treasurer's office, you know, has access to the data collector and they do that. Um, again, that's another part that districts need to talk through to see who's going to be responsible so that those, that information doesn't get missed. Okay. And then lastly is obviously just running the actual collection, um, you know, needs to, you know, be run multiple times until, the information is accurately reported. Um, the again, level ones are going to be used for your um, as your per debt. Um, so you want to run the collection. First thing you want to do is look at that those level one reports and those errors, and then clean come back to um, the redesign and uh, make any cha necessary changes and keep running that going through that process. Um, I did link, and we kind of talked about this already. That's the um, the errors explanation. So that was the checklist that we um, talked about a little earlier. Um, and then lastly, we have a document that's um, EMIS field names and locations. So this tells us exactly, um, you know, on each record um, where the the information is coming from. So I did include that link as well. So if you have any questions about that, um, 
we can go ahead and you can go ahead and use that as a resource. Oops. Okay, let me scroll down. I think that was all. Okay, so that steps through the checklist in the start of the school year. Um, does anybody have any questions at all? I know that's a lot to throw at you in um, a short amount of time. Let me, oh, thank you. I, I hope it's helpful. Um, try to put some detail in it and, and make it, um, you know, something you can just print out and maybe give to your districts and, it, you know, they can step through some of those steps themselves. So thank you so much. Um, I did want to mention, I'm sure you're, you know, all have this bookmarked and are well aware of it, but um, the, the initial staff and course collection um, does open up September 7th. So we have a little while, um, but that will be here before we know it. But I just wanted to point out that date and make you all aware, um, you know, districts will get school started and then probably be ready to, you know, start running that data collection for fiscal year 24, crazy. Lastly, um, I did wanna mention that at OETSA, um, we are going to do a session on um, EMIS and taking a deeper dive into the staff in a financial level one and level two reports. Um, Teresa Williams and a member from ODE um, are going to be leading up that session. So um, it is, you know, in the big ballroom. Um, we were, you know, thinking that probably a lot of the EMIS staff would want to attend this as well. So we're going to have you move out from the normal, excuse me, um, fiscal area um, into the big ballroom for that session and hopefully, you know, get some really good information um, when it comes to the data collector side. You know, we, we talk a lot about the state software side and that aspect, but we're gonna get ODE and um, the data collector perspective for um, on, you know, on that side of things. So hopefully if you haven't registered, please, you know, go out to the WETSA website. Um, we have a lot of other very valuable um, uh, sessions. We're gonna talk about mastering mid-year contracts, taking a deeper dive into disbursements, um, we're going to talk about the requisition and employee workflows, that onboarding um, piece, um, budgeting. Um, we're going to have a treasurer talk about budgeting, um, scheduling reports in the job scheduler, and fingers crossed, the data, our document storage. Um, we, we hope to have that um, piece in place as well. Um, and then um, a session on using the EMIS information to balance your financial reports that come from ODE. And then lastly, a session from um, AOS. So lots of, you know, not just EMIS related, but lots of good fiscal information that we hope, um, you know, you'll, you'll hope to see you there and hopefully you, you find it helpful as well. So if you haven't registered, do so. I think the deadline before the registration cost goes up is, the 30th. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions at all? I've talked way, probably way more than what you guys want to hear. Um, I think our next week's session, if I go to, just to point that out quickly, one of these has to be, okay, I'll go to our wiki page. I'm gonna to go to training meetings and trainings. And next week's session, I think Amanda is the one that will be doing a session on um, report generation and best practices, taking a deeper dive into use, USAS reports and best practices when generating those reports. So if you haven't registered for that, um, you know, please do so and if there are no questions, thank everybody for their time and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend.